Joe, we understand that you have something big to announce. Could you tell us what it is? Yeah, I think it comes a time where everyone has to flip the page, turn a new chapter, and this is my time to do that. This is my official retirement, and I'm really grateful for everything that swimming has given me. It's taught me the people I've met along the way, and now it's time for a new chapter, a new journey. And now that you've announced your retirement, what do you feel? <laughs> All sorts of emotions. We have been planning this. It has been in the back of my mind for quite some time. Um, there are various obstacles, hurdles that we've had to overcome, but I was ready to do something else. I didn't get the excitement that I had waking up at four years old, seeing my friends, going to the pool, jumping in a, a cold pool outside. I get that same excitement now, looking forward to going to the office, trying to excel what I'd like to do in the next phase. I guess that's when you know it's time. Right, and why did you decide that now is the time to call it a day? Yeah, I, I was still grinding through the possibilities of making it to Paris. I'd always told myself that I'd finish uh, when I was 29, 2024, Paris Olympics, a beautiful city. Um, physically, mentally, you'd be at your peak. So that makes the most sense, right? And sometimes things change. Um, I believe that this change is for the better. And my time just came a bit earlier than expected. It's okay. That just means that we have more time and more room to excel in the next phase of my life. What triggered that first thought of retiring from competitive swimming? I did not enjoy the grind anymore. Nothing in life is easy. You have to earn it. You have to go out and work for it. I knew that deep down I wasn't in a spot where I wanted to work for it anymore. I wanted to work for something else. And it takes a bit of time to come to that realization that, okay, what I'm feeling is actually what I want. It's real. And after that, it takes a bit of time. You, know, you let it sit in, process it. And finally, here we are today, making the announcement, having your thoughts, the plannings become a reality. And, and how long did you take um, to think about this retirement plan? You know, yeah. Did you consult your, your mom? Um, could you talk us through the process of getting here today? Yeah, um, mom was one of the first few people I spoke to this about. And of course, knowing mom, she's go for another one, go for another one, you know, push, push, push. I know she loves watching me swim. It's like, okay, um, you know, there are a lot of other people out there that want you to swim as well. It's like, mom, I'm having this conversation with you. Um, your opinion matters the most. And I want to know what you think. It's like, well, I'll support you uh, with whatever you'd like to do. So that was comforting in itself. And spoke to some coaches as well, of course, my team around. And I was quite shocked with, with the responses. I was shocked because more or less everyone understood that this was coming, this was how I felt. So in a way, that's kind of how tuned in everyone was. Everyone, everyone knew me that well, sometimes even better than I know myself. But I took a lot of comfort knowing that everyone was behind this decision. Mm. And given that this is an Olympic year, you know, Paris so close around the corner, it must feel a bit of bittersweet for you. Definitely. I think I've been doing this for 25, 26 years of my life. You know, swimming is, swimming is all I've known up until, you know, maybe a year or two ago. And having to change that identity, um, change that perception, change the routine, it is pretty taxing. Um, it is pretty scary, but at the same time, as athletes, I think it's important not to put your entire identity around your sport. And that's when you start honing in other skills, right? How do you affect the people around you? Um, how do you move the need needle forward? There are many things that, you know, not just athletes, but people transitioning can bring to the table. And this is something that I plan to apply myself to. And when one chapter closes, another chapter opens, right, Joe? Absolutely. So what future plans do you have now that you're putting the competitive days behind? Yeah, so we've got a pretty stacked schedule, actually. Um, to pre-qualify before I answer that, I think it's important to have a mission, have a sense of direction. As athletes, we understand that you have a goal, plan, execute. If you don't have that, you're going to go crazy, you know? The first thing, first things first on the business side, right? Finance and sports, I'm getting to the VC space, on the swim school, 
try to grow my swim school as much as possible, teach kids to be water safe. Um, on also the social aspect, the, the sports, sports front. I've been having conversations with Minister Edwin, um, Alan, Alan Go, about how I can help move that needle forward. So that conversation has started. We're planning, uh, we're putting, putting together a plan around it. But I want to give back to the sporting society. I don't want to be, I don't want to vanish. I think there's a lot that I can offer. And there are a lot of hurdles that I've had to overcome along with my parents and team, which I can impart on the younger athletes. The whole goal is to make sure that they can go further than the previous generation. And if time is of essence, if they can understand this knowledge earlier, quicker, why not? That's just another feather in their cap. It gives me a big fulfillment as well, right? Like, how do you make the person next to you better? And coming from an individual sport athlete, I'm conditioned to be selfish, right? I have one lane myself. I either win or I lose. That's on me. But how do you take that team sport mentality and apply it to, to this landscape? Right, and, and you said that you wanted to move the needle in terms of helping others, um, help, helping, I guess, young swimmers. Um, how, how do you think you're, you're going to do that, especially yeah. with the help of the government, um, as you said? Yeah, so let's go back a little bit. 20 years ago, in early 2000s, I was nine, eight, nine years old, and we, is, we used to have uh, junior C age. That was my first meet I represented Singapore. The support structures that we had back then versus now are completely different. We're on different universes. And it brings a lot of joy for me to see that. With that being said, there are ways that we can always get better. How do you support the kids? How do you support the parents? And I think the number one question we have to ask, ask ourselves is this. What are we going to do, not only for the kids, but the parents, to allow them to let us have their kids and say, hey, sports is actually a viable future, a viable pathway for my kid to earn a living, be taught good values, be a better person, the person that they aspire to be down the line. Those are the questions that we have to ask. And you also talked about um, developing your, your, your swim school further. Could, could you talk about some of your plans that you have yeah. for your swim school? I, I can't share a lot of plans right now, but you know, not just only in the Singapore market, but regional markets as well. Um, I see a lot of good partnerships that can be forged. Um, the whole goal of this, it, first and foremost, this is a business, right? But secondly, what are the values of the missions that we have behind it? How do you get a better swimmer? Competition, anything in the business world, competition, everything is compete, compete, compete. And with each competition, you, you get to a higher level. So it only makes sense if you have a bigger pool of competitors, people from all backgrounds, different trainings, come together and elevate that level together. It's going to take quite some time, but this is the vision that I see for my school. And do you think you'll spend a lot more time focusing on your, your school? I have good partners around as well. I've got a good GM that helps. I've got good coaches, uh, dedicated staff. So. As far as operationally, I trust my team. In terms of planning, my partners, my GM, my coaches to come in, give their thoughts. I've seen us grow over the past few years. COVID was hard. We've rebounded well after COVID. And right now, it's more about, okay, where do we see ourselves in 5, 10, 15 years, right? Now we're working towards getting to each of those hurdles, each of those stepping stones to be where we want to be at the end of the day. If you know all these things, you know the pieces of the puzzle was 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 what you imagined yeah. um, to to be waiting for you when when you retire. Yeah. So all these things take time. Um, the simple answer would be no, because plans always change. I thought I was going to work in a bank, um, do wealth management, and it's funny how things change quickly. I can't do an eight thirty to five thirty job. I've realized that I need to be on my own time. And here we are today. And I just want to walk down the memory lane of what has been such an illustrious career for you. Could you tell us what your proudest achievement is? My proudest achievement? I'm not going to say Rio Olympics. I mean, that's, that was a culmination of everything. 
we just finished NCAAs at Texas right now. And it's easy because this is fresh in my mind. So we went four for four. Um, all my years over there were the third team in history to do that. And looking back and seeing how fast the sport of swimming has become, especially in short course yards, I'd say winning four for four was one of my, if not my proudest achievement. And we won as a team. Mm -hmm. And you're a three-time Olympian beginning with London in 2012. How different was each of these experiences? In well, London, I was still you know, a little kid, uh, 17. I had the whole cap and goggle fiasco. I didn't know how to handle my emotions. I had a lot of learning through that, painful learning, I might add. And then we go to Rio. Four years later, I was hungry, supercharged, uh, mentally, physically, in, in a completely different realm from 2012 and I was just able to execute. And then of course with Tokyo in 21, the Olympics getting pushed back one year, um, I could have handled a lot of things a bit better leading up to, to the Tokyo Olympics. But that's how, that's how the cookie crumbles sometime, right? Um, you learn these things about yourself day in and day out. I learned that from 16 to 21. You can't train like you're 20, 21 years old anymore. You have to approach things differently and it's crazy that you mentioned this because last night I was watching uh, The Last Dance as well, in addition to Grey's. And the last episode, MJ said his sixth title meant the most to him because back in 90, 91, he was hungry, determined, it's just all raw talent. But get to his last one, he could actually hone in his body, his mindset. He knew how to get the most out of his body. That was the part where I wish I could have gotten to in, 20, in Tokyo. But like I said, sometimes things happen for a reason and that's just how it works. Right, and in Rio, you know, your gold medal was obviously historic for Singapore. Have you seen the good that it has, it has done for the sporting community here? Absolutely, I think one word sums it up, belief. So. People believe that they can be world beaters. People believe that it can be done. People believe that sports is a viable career path, a future. Um, I see that's what the Olympics has done. I'm very proud of it. But I do believe that we have a lot more room to grow. So let's use that as a springboard to get to where we want to be. And could you talk about the in the first 24 hours after winning that, that medal in Rio? that goal in Rio, um, were there any moments that you, know, you still remember vividly until today? Absolutely. The, the one and only actually is um, after, during the medal ceremony, I was having a good time with Michael and taking pictures, making out walk around, and he asked, what are you doing tonight? I'm like, dude, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna go sleep. I'm, I'm beat, man, I'm tired. He's like, he looked at me and smiled, and he's like, nah, you're not gonna sleep. And I'm looking at him like, I just beat my idol. Like I have a huge amount of respect for him. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna indulge in this back and forth. I'm like, okay, maybe I won't sleep. Maybe I will. Let's see. He was right. I didn't sleep that night. I had an early morning flight to come back to Singapore, unplanned. Um, and I remember it turned 6 a.m. I wanted to get a quick breakfast. In the Olympic Village, my I myself, I have one thing only. I have a routine. I don't touch anything until after I'm done swimming. I have cereal in the morning, I have cereal before I go for finals at night. Of course you have pastas and you know, chicken breast for lunch, but this particular morning I had cereal again, listened to music and I told myself, my life will never be the same again. Like, like you know, this is it. And it was a beautiful sunrise coming over and the whole moment is almost surreal. I still vividly remember that. All right, and you know, your, your life has, has really changed after that win. Um, and, and your mom and late dad were so much a part of your, your journey throughout all this. How important and how significant was their support throughout the years? Unquantifiable. Without them, obviously, support-wise, putting um, the sacrifices that they had to do financially, but also on their marriage side. Right? They had to live apart back and forth every three months making sure that I was taken care of in the U.S., at least in high school, for what, four years. 
Um, that, that's a huge, huge commitment on everyone's part. I didn't understand how big at that time, of course, I was doing my thing, um, 16, 17 year old teenage angst, I couldn't care less, right? But now looking back, yeah, that, that's pretty special. Yeah, there's no way I'd be here without them. Zero chance. And it certainly takes a village, you know, your coaches, your friends, family members, your team. You know, how have they support you, supported you over the years? Yeah, so with coaches studying Franco Vincent and TMCC, right? Uh, he taught me, he taught me the competitive spirit of never giving up. He used to have kids go 25 meters ahead, bigger kids. I used to get really annoyed. I'm like, if you want to beat me, beat me straight up. Don't have flippers on. Don't be half a pull in front. Of course, you know, I never catch them, but it's just go, go, go all the time. So starting from that, of course, you have um, Coach Ken, SICC, you have Serge in Jacksonville. Serge was the first actually huge father, father figure um, coach that I had, and he put up with a lot of my nonsense, a lot. Think of teenage angst plus homesick plus um, having to acclimatize their different culture plus my kind of crankiness or temper that creates a really bad storm. So he had to weather that storm. And for that, I'll always love him. And then you have Eddie in Texas, granddaddy of coaches. Um, he just retired actually uh, yesterday. And he's gonna go down as the world's best coach. Most wins, most everything, a bucket load of wisdom. He's awesome. And then of course, coming back, you got Sonia, you got G. Uh, they played a huge role as well. Sonia, I like to call her Mama Bear. You know, she's, nothing will get by her. And she, she really does a lot for us. G as well, pushing the needle in his way, in the way he knows how to. He's grown a lot, he's matured, and he, we have a really, really good head coach at that helm. And I believe that that team can move that needle forward. Right, and, and how do you think your successes have brought Singapore's swimming standards to the next level? Before we used to think Sea Games was the creme de la creme, you know, the meat that everyone looks forward to. It is still an important meat for our country. A lot of pride on the line. But our standards have have increased. They've they've gone up. Now Asian Games is the norm, World Championships, and then the Olympics. So like I said, it takes time, right? Twenty years ago Sea Games. Twenty years later, Asian Games is still pretty darn good, you know? And then the Olympics will, will be what we set our sights on. Mm. Joe, and, and now that you've um, announced your retirement, what do you think will happen um, to your endorsements and your sponsorships? Well, I, I can't answer that one. I, I don't know. All I can say is I've had wonderful brands that I've worked with along the ways. I've had brands and supporters, like Boss, for example, come out and become family friends, become part of the team. Our relationship extends much further than just, you know, a signature and a dotted line. We've actually become family. So I don't know what's gonna happen. Quite frankly, I'm not worried about what's gonna happen. We can only worry and focus on the things that we'd like to achieve and we'd like, we can control. Everything else is just a bonus. And, and Joey, you also can't avoid talking about a difficult episode of the, after the Hanoi Sea Games in 2021. Two years on, do you look back at it with some sense of regret? And more importantly, um, were there any lessons that, that you know, you've, you've gleaned from, from that episode? I think two, two years removed, I just think to myself, there are some things in life where you learn from. Uh, one of my coaches said, you win or you learn, right? No such thing as losing. And that's the kind of mindset that we need to have moving forward. A sense of regret. Well, I feel like I could have done things better. Um, but at the same time, with every challenge or every obstacle comes a new opportunity, right? So control the things that you can. Don't worry about the things you can't control. I'm looking forward. And at the same time, I do believe I've become a lot wiser after that as well. So it was a huge learning curve. And what do you hope um, the kind of legacy you, you want to be remembered for? Yeah, no. someone said to me, um, people are going to remember you not for 
your achievements, not for your accomplishments, but how you made them feel. And while your achievements will give you that platform to inspire change and to affect others, I do believe the legacy I'd like to leave is you can achieve anything you can if you set your mind to it. Don't, don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do it. So I've got a bad back, right? And I'm at least sometimes four to six inches shorter than the person next to me at the Olympics. And it's still done. So if anyone tells you that you can't do it because you're small or you're weak or whatever, go work towards it. But never actually let them believe that because it's all fluff. And that's them telling you, that's them sharing their opinion. Sure. Listen to it. If it's constructive criticism, go. But never give up. Like there, that, those words or that phrase should never be in your vocabulary. It doesn't exist. Good yeah, <laughs> so just keep working to it. You never know. Right, and, and what do you think it takes for Singapore to produce another Olympic champion? Well, we have a pretty good shot this year, so <laughs> let's see with Max. Um, I believe he can do it. I think it would be huge for our country. Uh, after that, it's how do you get another Olympic champion as well? A viable career path. Circling back to what we said about parents, you have to you have, to make, you have to make the parents feel comfortable and show them that sports is a viable career path, right? And we do have a few things to work out, but it's not impossible. We all play for the same team. So after the Olympics, we can see the effect sports has on bringing a nation together, all the celebrations, the mood, um, like the mood people are in. I didn't expect that personally. It was a huge eye opener. But I hope that shows everyone how big winning at that stage can do for our country and how much good and how much we can shift with that power. So what do we have to do? Well, we gotta sit down, have a long chat, iron out a plan, but we do have all the, the support structures in place right now. And would you ever consider coming out of retirement? <laughs> <laughs> never say never. But uh, as of right now, I don't think so. Uh, I know Michael was asked that in 2012. He did retire and then came back to 16. I don't know. Right now, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> right, and, and my last question for you, Joe. Um, if you have one message for young swimmers, you know, like the boy you were um, many years ago with a big dream, uh, what would it be, you know, f for, for them to achieve success such as yours or even better? Yeah, uh, not just swimmers, but just athletes or anyone in general. I'd say just have fun, you know. I'm an only child. I drew, find your inspiration, find your whys. My why was very simple. I was lo like, only child syndrome can be a bit lonely. Um, I wanted to be out there with my teammates, my friends, and just be a part of my, you know, with brothers and sisters and I so happen to enjoy swimming at the same time. I don't know why I enjoy the feel of the water, but that's what got me out of bed in the morning. So you just got to find your whys and just have fun with it. If you're not having fun with it, if you can't figure out your whys, that might be a pretty good indicator that you're, you're primed for something else. It's okay. Just go out there and find it. And perhaps a message for yourself you know, as you step into a new phase of life. <laughs> Remember this interview and never give up. Don't forget anything and never take anything for granted because you never know. Tomorrow's a promise to no one and make every day count as best as you can. Don't have to be perfect. Just go out there and do it. And, and do you think you'll be a completely different person now that you've put your competitive days behind? No, I'm still going to be competitive. I still am competitive. You can't, you can't put that behind. You just got to channel that competitiveness into a different, different realm, a different space. So no, I am who I am and I'll never change.